uh, like art sound installation that it's like when you're like going to, to on this running floor there is like uh, you know some voice like coming from somewhere saying mazel tov you know and uh, so yeah we were like we were laughing about it and then uh, uh, some, some time later my, my mother also she came to visit me uh, to Amsterdam and she said what is this like uh, silly sound installation in the Schiphol airport it's like you know when you go on this on this running floor there is some speakers and, he, and they say your daughter you know and <laughs> like we figured out later or I mean I figured out that what what they were talking about was actually this this uh, practical sound installation that says mind your step you know like uh, <laughs> so uh, so I mean so much about the resolution I mean uh, you know like what people hear you know like and, and so so this is this is kind of a thing that that when we say in the in the in the uh, in our concept that like this kind of uh, ambiguity of what, what is in the air and what we hear, you know, listening, hearing process. You know, this was kind of uh, interesting for us to, to, to work on that, and this is one of, of, of like, personal fascinations that, that draw us to that. Uh, another one is like a mythological, uh, historical uh, story, and it's about uh, the, the well-known fact about the Delphic oracles in the ancient Greece. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's not really clear what happened there, but there is like uh, uh, there is like one story about it that I like even even if it's not true doesn't matter but but I found somewhere in some book that I don't know I don't remember now but uh, that, that the procedure was actually like this there was this uh, priestess uh, Pitya that uh, that was that was being brought into this cave and then in the middle of the cave there was this hole coming like in the ground and from this hole in the ground were coming some fumes like some kind of toxic fumes. And uh, Pitya would go there, and she would get intoxicated, read, drug, and and then she would start mumbling, you know, something, with some, some kind of incomprehensible, uh, like, things. And then there were these priests around her that they would translate or interpret what she said, and that's how they would like convey an answer to the to the seeker, to the to the answer seeker. So if if we analyze that, we have like this kind of process of like, uh, like completely abstract event and sound being translated by the priests that were probably like highly politically aware and, and like, uh, you know, they would basically kind of, you know, give some answers to, to, to the seekers. And uh, it had obviously nothing to do with what this woman was mumbling. So, again, about, like, the, here is the, the interpretation part that was interesting for us. So. Something, somebody said something, nobody uh, can hear it anymore because it's gone, but the interpretations stay. So, uh, I would like to move quickly to the next, uh, so th these were like some uh, personal uh, uh, fascinations, and then uh, I would move, move to the next chapter, just like say how we uh, kind of conceived and structured the exhibition in sign, and uh, we decided to, to structure conceptually uh, the, uh, our, our exhibition in two layers. One would be the audio, audio visual lab, which, is, which would in a way dissect the phenomena of intentional hearing by displaying some psychoacoustic uh, phenomena and some auditory illusions in like a spire. So here you can see, uh, if you go back, yeah, this is like how, how it looks. So you, so you see there is like some some hanging screens with some audiovisual perceptive uh, tricks, and, uh, and speakers with like a very sparse uh, kind of uh, clinic uh, auditory illusions. Uh, we will, uh, and, and then the second layer would be the the artistic works that draw from that phenomena of intentional listening and hearing processes. So we would like to uh, maybe just display for you like uh, one. Uh, Audiovisual uh, like a phenomena that's called the McGurk effect, and with, and, uh, and, uh, and and one that is purely audio. So the McGurk effect, <laughs> I don't want to say anything wrong. It's a perceptual phenomena uh, which demonstrates the interaction between hearing and vision in speech perception. 
it suggests that speech perception is multimodal. That means that it involves information from more than one sensory modality. Uh, it means like when we are when we are listening to somebody uh, speaking, the, uh, the 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 uh, what we hear is not influenced only by sound, but but also also by us like uh, looking at the, the lips of this person and. Uh, this uh, this uh, McGurk effect like like uh, shows that really like uh, obviously. So what happens? The so this effect might might be experienced when a video of one phoneme's production is dubbed with a sound recording of a different phoneme being spoken. So we have a uh, audio information is of some phoneme and the video information of uh, another phoneme. What happens is that if we look at the recording, we will shortly demonstrate that we basically hear what we see and not not the sound. So, uh, and maybe like, just like look at, it's a very bad solution, but it works. Just uh, look at the recording and uh, and then uh, listen, uh, I, yeah, hear it once and then tell me what you hear. Ba, 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 ba. Bama. So what was now? Bama. 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 Okay, so it's different stuff. Now close your eyes and we, I, I promise we're going to play the same. Bama. 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 I mean, it's, 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 it's the same. It's, it's just ba all the time. Yeah. So, yeah? Yeah. And, and I mean, and this, this is this is very obvious one. There are like, like there are different combinations where you hear the, the third thing, like like the, you, they they play audio of ga and and video of da, and you you hear I don't know <laughs> da for example the, the third one. Uh, so that that's one thing that was displayed. Another another like a more subtle kind of uh, 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 audio illusion is the that we want to show is the backward extension of a tone, not this one. And it's, it's a very simple one. Like, you see like a, a chart and the uh, a graph and the, the black uh, square represents white noise, like time is to the right, and then this, this little line represents a sine tone. Uh, what happens is that like, we tend to hear uh, the, si the, the short little sine tone, tone Long, the, the, the short little sine tone is longer when it's uh, preceded by this uh, uh, white noise uh, chunk than when it's just played in the side in the side. So let's just uh, play it and uh, hear it. It's a more subtle thing. <coughs> like physically the same length, but we kind of tend to hear it long, uh, a bit shorter when it's just in silence. So, I mean, there were there were many of these uh, like kind of uh, blips and, and noises and this ba, da, ba, stuff like just to kind of uh, spread around the, the place and they created some kind of a psychoacoustic soundscape. And, uh, now, the, the, the second part of the exhibition was the artistic works that, that, that ride on this phenomenon, and the boy will say something about the, like, who we invited. Yeah, well, as, as we mentioned, there was class in Irache as a duo, which had a kind of a very different approach with, the, with this kind of topic, with the phones and the stories of the phones. And there was also Rosa Barba and Janssen Werner, who made the soundtrack. And there was my work. Uh, which is called TV and radio, and it's uh, two mono FM transmissions and a bunch of receivers, radios. Normally, I, I mean, generally, I'm not a sound artist and I'm dealing with different stuff, but uh, once in a while I brush upon the, like, you know, sound and context of sound and so on. And uh, this, uh, this piece, uh, I, I took it a little bit differently, and uh, I will talk about how I generated this piece, how I, I mean, the origins and uh, my experience in the past, and the process I made it, and the, 
final product, if you call it like that. Well, uh, you might say that someone might say that I watch news too often, and uh, but I like to know everything every day, what happens. I like to behold our world every day. But uh, of course, I'm not immune to relentless exposure of uh, and of gruesome images which are every day on TV. And uh, I rarely have any emotional response to the images of war and destruction. And I sat down and I thought, uh, what's going on? Why, why, why is this happening? Why these images are just leaving me cold? Uh, it seems like my, I don't know, neurological highways between my eyes and brain are stuck, or perhaps our visual process is too complex. And then I thought, on the other hand, what we hear might be crucial. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, that auditory is sometimes rather faster than visual. Contrary to the eye, the ear is the organ that physically receives uh, sensation. Well, it seems like that. In the course of hearing, as Jonathan explained much better than I did, uh, I mean, the, the airway comes and, and stimulates uh, physically uh, the membrane, and then the signal goes, and so on. This actual straightforward physical occurrence is the what really interests me, and is uh, precisely these physical characteristics in the auditory process uh, is the crucial difference between these two senses. And we might say that the total experience of certain uh, situation in life is achieved only through a combination of both senses, and that most of the time they are inseparable. But, uh, however, in everyday life we can experience uh, different situations where we hear the sirens of the ambulance before we see the car, uh, if we go to a football match, we, see the, we hear the, the noise before uh, we see the, the crowd, or if the bomb is falling in you know, this horrifying sound, we hear first and then we see the explosion, etc. Moreover, even when we listen to the radio, we hear, uh, uh, we, we can feel as we see, feel, smell, or touch the, the actually what we hear. And what I find interesting is this gap. And this gap uh, is uh, some kind of, a, perhaps for me, a platform where I could, when I took a certain experiment, uh, which is manifested in this work. Uh, I try to repeat the situation I have experienced myself, since some of the most important news that entered the world's homes with the spine-chilling images has come to me orally. Uh, it was due to certain circumstances that I was exposed to this news uh, via radio and not TV. Um, for instance, I remember uh, that when the war broke out in Iraq, my only source of information was a little radio that I, I had in my toilet. Uh, when I think back, the irony of the whole situation couldn't be greater. The invasion of Iraq was announced to me through a little silver radio, which was at the same time a paper, toilet paper holder. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this little thing, after delivering this kind of news, became a kind of uh, household relic. And uh, after that, uh, even uh, uh, there were other news uh, from Serbia, which was very important. I took, the, I took out the, the, the radio from the toilet, put it on the dining table. Everything looked really surreal. And, and, and really absurd. Uh, it was not until much later when I saw uh, uh, images from uh, uh, Baghdad's uh, sky, uh, uh, and, and what happened at that moment, I could analyze them only as a, some kind of 19th century painting, like uh, you know, composition, color, etc. Uh, the context of the images disappeared. Without the toilet radio, they didn't seem to make sense. I still remember the dark blue sky and the piercing light, and all looked like to me like some kind of science fiction movie. Uh, the idea of war became very remote to me, and uh, it was this strange gap, as I was talking about. If I would go back to the radio, I would uh, every word which was remotely uh, linked to war, I could immediately picture the, the, the images from Baghdad, and if I would look at the images, my ears were pounding, uh, remembering the sounds from the radio. Um, so the, the, then after that I, I decided to stop watching images for a while to see what, what, what would happen and, and so on. And the lack of imagery changes or even minimizes one exposure to the media campaigns. 
but does it influence one emotional response? Because of course that was the, the initial idea of this experiment. And if it does, in what way? Let's say there is a certain image we cannot see. And if we were to use one sense, let's say hearing, to describe or explain the effect of another, would we still have the same emotional response? Or further, is it possible to hear an image instead of seeing it? Would we be referring to the same thing? So the installation entitled TV and Radio represents a collaboration with several artists and curators that are subjected to the same process I experienced uh, before. I asked them to describe uh, several images, uh, selection of images from Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, and uh, Palestine. Uh, the description method that uh, they used was the audio description, which is used for uh, uh, helping uh, blind people or people with a poor vision to follow the, the you know, movies, uh, going to the museums, watch paintings, etc. And uh, in audio description, narrators typically describe action, gestures, scene changes, and other visual informations. So, uh, uh, in order to experience what I'm saying, there is uh, in the back in the studio one, there is uh, little examples of the, uh, this work, I mean the, the stories on the radio. So this was my work, and now we go back to, to your work. Uh -huh. Okay, so we were talking a lot, like we mentioned before, like the, the catalytic event of the whole show, the death of uh, Mr. Rigoberto Pizarro. And uh, the, the, the work with which I, I contributed to this exhibition is called Blow Up. This is like a, like a photo of it. I will talk about it. You will be able to see it here like in 15, 20 minutes if everything goes well. Uh, and uh, the installation, as I said, is like uh, entirely based on the recent, recent airplane incidents in which a man was shot dead by the US Air Marshals due to instantaneous interpretation of what he said. The U.S. Air Marshals are like undercover uh, police on the airport. Every American flight has two policemen in the, in, uh, in, in the civil clothes there after the 9-11. So the story of what happened, I will say the background and then I will say how, how I like uh, deal with this and make a piece of art about it. So the story goes like that. Just before a takeoff, a man was nervously walking up and down the aisle shouting something. Uh, when asked later, all the passengers said that they heard him shout, I have to go out, while the two air marshals said they heard him shout, I have a bomb. When the man ra ran out of the plane, the, the two air marshals went after him and uh, shot him, I, I think, five or six times. Uh, they killed him and he didn't have a bomb. It turned out he was like a bipolar person who didn't take his medications. His wife was with him on the plane, like uh, running after him and, uh, and screaming like he's bipolar, he's bipolar. But okay, so that happened. The, the event took place on 7th of November 2005 on American Airlines flight uh, from uh, Miami to Orlando, Florida. Uh, and uh, what is the shocking and the interesting thing about this whole incident is that the first report on BBC showed uh, passengers uh, showed passengers who were almost uh, unanimous in saying that Albinar had shouted, I have to go out, while the two air marshals claimed he had said, I have a bomb. This clip was soon removed from the BBC website. What became the official interpretation of the event was that the most people had heard him say, I have a bomb. Although there is still an article in Time magazine uh, uh, entitled, I uh, entitled Eyewitness, I Never Heard the Word Bomb. And there is like an article that actually a person said that they were even like asking him if, 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 he, uh, if he heard the B word. So, and, and in the final report that is possible to find it on the internet, there is not even clear if, if uh, uh, Mr. Rigoberto Alpizar was talking Spanish or English. So it's like a complete, like, Fog, complete fog, yeah? Uh, but okay, the installation now. What did I do with this? Uh, I took the two, the two sentences. I have to go out and I have a bomb. And uh, I played them simultaneously 
and I stretch them in a, in a granular way 300 times, so meaning the pitch stays and everything stays, uh, uh, and uh, it's just like it's just stretched in time. And uh, the image that you see actually is the mouth with the light inside, uh, with the red light inside, so there's this kind of abstract thing going on. Uh, in, in the visual. And they are played simultaneously, one on this screen, one on that screen, we will all be able to see and hear it. And what happens, like, the, the, these two sentences become like nine minutes long. And what happens is like the, 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 the meaning of the words is lost, and what we hear is the, the, the sonic difference between the, the words, uh, between the sounds of the words. And, uh, and what is interesting, like, I would just like to point out if there were people on the lecture yesterday when Joel Ryan was talking about like conscious, uh, like like being reflective and uh, being a musician and that like the, the, this kind of perception of sound and reacting to sound and playing music is much 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 faster than uh, than uh, than uh, being reflective. They, uh, apparently there was like a, there was like there are new results from like a Gestalt. Uh, People in, in Germany, they, they say that it takes up, up to seven seconds to, to reflect on something. So it's, it's really a long time. So so by 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 stretching like these two words, it's, some, it's also kind of like uh, reflecting on the sound. Say, I mean, I would say quote unquote. So what what I wanted the installation to point out is the difference on on two levels. So one is the pure sonic difference between the words and the difference. Uh, and, and then the other uh, is the difference between the, the physical reality and one's hearing of the words uttered, which appear to be subjective, but is actually quite culturally conditioned, usually. Uh, the title of the installation uh, makes double reference also. The first one is like to the very obvious one to the, to the, the bomb, yeah, so the, the explosive nature of the, nature of the bomb, the, the, the title is blow up. And uh, the the second one is to the to the Antonioni's movie with the same title, and it, it refers to the act of zooming in. So, like in Antonioni, you have a zoom in, like a visual zoom in, on a tra on a traumatic event. In both cases, murder, and to the mystical, uh, mysterious historical erasure or negation of the event itself. So, of this crime be it uh, by the official authorities or the forces of hidden political powers. Uh, so that's as much as I can, I can say about, uh, about this work. Like the, the, another thing is the experience of it that you can have later. We can, because there is a question, we have a, 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 another text from a, a, a colleague artist, sound artist who contributed to the uh, to the magazine, to the publication, and uh, basically he asked me if I could read it. So we, I think we have time. And, and then basically, because when he wrote it, he also made a little uh, yeah, I will tell gif and bell. Uh, and when he wrote the text, he also made a little uh, video and uh, audio recording with it. So we're gonna play that. And I'm going to just read the, the, the text from the beginning. It's called Just Imagine. Just imagine listening to the opening of a glass jar of uhorki, which means a pickled cucumber in uh, uh, Slovak. Uh, just imagine uh, the opening of a glass jar of uhorki with the metal lid, and at the same time watching a toy gun popping, you hear your life softly voiced and with urgent touch. You heard it as a call and so you gave your life since you had no money at all anyway. The last hallucination, sound hallucination my grandmother, grand grandmother had two days before she died. She heard the whole circus traveling slowly through the street where she lived in the middle of the night. The next morning she could vividly describe everything she had not seen but only heard as if she really had seen it. A girl. After two days of deafness because of a bad cold, she started to hear again, but described unusual sounds that had been added to her normal hearing. She blamed it on a water in her ears or head. Obviously, the brain is a good synthesizer. And funny enough, 
the thing is constantly play, playing tricks with the memory and time deep inside us because we are like that. Listening to the same sounds for a while, there's always something else that reaches our ear. Voices added and gone. Somehow we are bound to believe that everyone hears the same. The opposite is true, as any of our body parts, including the brain, are physically quite different among humans, yet somehow the same. Obviously, we must perceive the world totally differently, yet are able to communicate about it in a similar way, as if we understand one another. Maybe the opposite is closer to a truth, but not yours, and yet it can be. We assume blind people have a better way of hearing and interpreting sounds. Most of us have memories of blind piano tuners. He would sit there and reach for the glass of beer, right there where my mother put it, without difficulty. And then he would ask, is it black piano or not? My father would be puzzled and ask my aunt, can he really hear that? The file, which he's re referring to, was recorded in a restaurant at noon and in the waiting room of a train station at the same time. It probably contains the following languages, Czech, Slovak, English, German, Hungarian, and French. It was done in a split stereo like most recordings up to the mid-60s. Done it again. This is an experiment. Once you start listening to it, do you imagine situations, things people say to one another? Can you sometimes visualize the environment? The more you listen to it, are other conceptualizations projected? What happened over there? Why were these sounds recorded and when? Can you guess? Surely the more we listen to it, the more we misunderstand, or is understanding possible at all? What is being said here, and do new voices pop up at the same time? Adding a visual reference, true or not? What changes the interpretation of sound? The popping of a type, toy gun, a glass jar of Uhorki, cars on the street and the skyline. Even if we are all different and definitely constantly lying about what we see and hear, believe in it and change and believe yet again, negate, sit still and listen again. What if a blind man looks out the window for a while, twice, and that temporarily deaf girl starts to hear and does the same, twice? and just assume we could record and play back their perception. You walk into a room and sit down and you have the blind man's and deaf girl's imagination, hearing, vision. You play it over and over again from memory. Are you really enjoying the merit interpretations that keep swirling around? Remember closing your eyes on a swing and going faster and faster, and then abruptly falling back as far as possible to reverse your arms and the hands loosen the grip on the roughness of the ropes. The eyes open suddenly. Then, realizing that those very same eyes and ears and everything with them are connected in the reality of the hallucination. That is real, like my grand-grandmother. And with her, we see the circus moving through the night. Okay. This was from contribution from Deep and Bell. With, the, with this image, and we have some other stuff, but uh, I think we're, we're going to stop uh, now and uh, yeah. I mean, if there is any questions, comments, or anything, very welcome. And uh, after that, we will we would like you to see that if you have a beer, and see some stuff, and hear some stuff. And and I mean, if there is no no questions, I would just like to use the opportunity. To first of all, thank to Sign Gallery from Groningen to, to make this exhibition possible and also for the catalog to make like to produce it. And we would also like to thank to uh, Stein to to uh, enable us this launch, uh, the presentation of the catalog, and to make this kind of a short uh, one-hour show here for you to see. Thanks. Okay. So, 
The female. Let me call this person the mystery person. This person has the head covered with a cloth, but also wears a hat on top of it. In sociology, that can mean someone is demanding something from the other. But the signal the woman gives to the mystery person is not a stop sign. It's more like she's telling the mystery person to keep your distance. I decide that the mystery person should be male. But maybe he has a special social function because of the dark clothing and hat? But why is the woman so rude to him then? I cannot figure it out. The other men wear normal clothes, a colored shirt with short sleeves, jeans or casual trousers. They have no hat or cap on their heads, protecting them from the sun. One of the men seems to be armed. I discover a pony-shaped kind of stick on his back. He is person number eight from the left. He stands beside the road, with his hands holding on to the waistband of his jeans. I'm not sure if this man is armed, but I cannot imagine carrying a stick around with you when it has no use to you. If he would need it for support, he'd hold it in his hands. There is no old person in the group who could need it during the trip. On the right side of the presumably armed man, there is one man who does not have a beard. Is he not from around there? I do not know. Four of the men who are carrying blackboards have taken off one layer of clothes. It could be a shirt. Or have they taken an extra shirt with them so that they can clean themselves up when they've reached their destiny?